So oh, it's recording now. Perfect. Great. Hi, everyone in virtual land. Uh, my name is Meredith. I'm the executive director of the West Big Data Innovation Hub. And uh, in collaboration with the California Governor's Office, the Water Foundation, Imagine H2O, and the Bay Area Council, uh, the West Big Data Hub is really excited to uh, welcome our colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, Kitware, Project Jupiter, and UC Berkeley for uh, this uh, data challenge tutorial. Um, special thanks for Matthias and others who I know were just in Austin um, for the SciPy conference, so you get their uh, fresh Monday morning uh, perspective here. Uh, and they have a lot of really exciting updates to share. Um, this uh, recording will be broken up into three parts, I think. Uh, the first one is going to be a high-level overview introduction, some of the latest and greatest um, from Matthias. It's designed to be accessible for beginners, so if you've never uh, touched a Project Jupiter um, notebook before, this is great. Um, if you have, feel free to chat for any of the latest and greatest updates, because this is the team. Uh, that is developing all of this uh, great technology. And then the second section will go into some examples, um, both R and Python notebooks. Uh, and so there's a really great way for you to follow along and play with um, that tutorial on real water data and some really compelling examples. And then the third, if I've got this right, is a more advanced uh, data visualization example with our partners at Kitware. That's about all I had for the introduction. Um, you can see the recording in case you happen to join after the launch event. Uh, the launch event that happened on June 26th is available um, on our YouTube channel. And uh, there's a whole suite of different uh, activities and commitments like this that are happening throughout uh, summer. We had over a dozen different commitments from organizations before the challenge um, was even launching. So we're really excited, uh, in particular, <coughs> this three-hour session um, as a good milestone to help teams get formed and really see what's possible to do with uh, open water data. Charlie, are you back now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I am unmuted. We're getting an echo in the room, so. So, so I'm Charu Vardarajan, and um, so I'm just organizing this tutorial here at Berkeley Lab uh, as Meredith reached out to us, uh, you know, seeing if we could make a commitment towards this water data challenge. So we're really excited. What we have lined up today is sort of three stages. You know, the first is a, a talk by Mati Matthias uh, Busnier, who is from Project Jupiter, uh, which is the lead organization that's, you know, spearheading the work on Jupiter and its development. And that's headed by Fernando Perez, uh, who is a joint faculty scientist at UC Berkeley as well as Berkeley Lab. And um, he's going to give a quick overview of Jupiter for those of you, especially, you know, sort of it's pretty basic. Those of you who've never heard about it or want to know about it, he's going to give you a quick introduction. Um, and there's a lot, a lot, lot, lot to learn about Jupiter. So there's a great, you know, there's some great resources, especially if you go to the, uh, you know, uh, website. There's lots of uh, examples and much more you can learn, but this is just meant to be sort of the tip of the iceberg, get you introduced to the concept and what we can do with it. And then we hope to give you some examples from uh, water data, qu water quality uh, analysis that's done by uh, Berkeley Lab uh, scientists and postdocs and students, actually. So um, Michelle Newcomer will give you a demo of an R notebook, and Valerie Patella will then give a demo of a Python notebook, just so because I saw from the list of participants who were there that we have uh, both a huge range of people who programmed in both R and Python. So it's really great for you to be able to see that you can do both uh, on Jupyter. Uh, and, and, you know, have different kernels for those. So that's, that's great. And then finally, uh, we have Kitware Incorporated. Uh, it's a company and they uh, have some really great tools for doing advanced mapping and visualization. So we kind of go from, you know, sort of beginner to advanced. And so we wanted to have it sort of modular so people can join in and out for whichever part of this is most interesting to you. 
But if you stay through this thing, it'll, it'll definitely ramp up in terms of um, how advanced it gets. So uh, hopefully you'll learn though. It's, uh, it's pretty, uh, it's a very cool tool. So we'll get started without further ado. Uh, for those of you who are, um, uh, want to follow along, all the materials are on the website. And it's part of, uh, it's the link to the talk. If you click on that, the materials are there, and so you could follow along with that if you don't want to take notes. Um, and Meredith in the chat has uh, put some put a link to the Slack discussion there too. So if you have questions, you could ping us on Slack too. Great, Matthias, you want to take it from here? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, don't say that I also have my phone with Zoom on the side, so if you send questions to everyone, I should be able to see them, and I can. Uh, slightly change the direction of my talk if you, if you have any specific topics you want to, to go through. Um, so just a tiny bit about me. As you say, I'm a, I have one, some echo. I don't know if someone is not muted. Um, so I, uh, Everybody who is not the speaker, mute yourself, please. So I'm part of the, uh, the Jupiter project. Uh, I originally uh, was um, a physicist, biophysicist. That's where I got my, my PhD in, but I was contributing a lot to Jupiter. And so I've been a core contributor uh, of IPython and Jupiter since before it was Jupiter in 2012. Uh, and my full-time job right now is a postdoctoral scholar to work on, on Jupiter full-time uh, at BITS, so at, um, at Berkeley. So if you go a bit um, through history and see how, how Jupiter came to be, um, everything started in 2001 um, um, with, uh, with a graduate student called Fernando Perez at the time, um, who, who discovered that he was using a number of languages like Perl, C, Make, to <coughs> basically do his, uh, his, um, his PhD. Um, and it was quite complicated to use many languages, and he decided to try a new language called Python uh, that had some nice interactive <laughs> capabilities. Uh, and so he created in 2001, um, he created something that was called IPython. Uh, mostly focused on, on interactive exploration of data, and it's important because that's one of the, uh, of the things that follow for, uh, for Jupiter. Um, uh, let's fast forward a couple of years, and in 2010-2011, um, the IPython uh, folks at the time got uh, uh, some funding to be able to, to refactor the code of IPython and split that into two processes. Uh, so a kernel in the back that executes code and a front end that um, displays the results to, to users. And that allowed us to create what was called in 2010-2011 the QT console, uh, which basically feel like a terminal, uh, but one of the first thing you can start to, to see in the screenshot here is that uh, you can have inline images. And when you're starting to have plots, instead of having many windows floating around, um, you can actually get directly your, your results inline. In 2012, we released the first version of the IPython notebook, so it was still not called Jupyter at the time, where basically with the maturation of web technology, um, the V8 um, uh, JavaScript machinery that made browser fast, um, the ability to get a, a browser-based web became, uh, became a possibility. And, uh, and with the web and all of the possibility of the web, now you can not only have images, but videos or sound directly in line into, um, into your browser. In 2000, something, uh, yeah, in 2013, we talked with um, uh, people behind the Julia language, say, well, we also want a notebook, and what you did, what you did seems great, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, can we accommodate the protocol that the browser is talking to with the Python kernel to also run Julia? And so in 2013, after a week of hacking, we basically had the IPython notebook that was able to both talk to Python and to Julia, so switch from one language to, to another. And in, a, in the following year, a lot of other languages were added. And a lot of people were wondering, well, why do I have to install IPython notebook if I want to run R, if I want to run Julia? And so in 2014, we decided to rename the Python agnostic part of IPython uh, to Jupyter, um, also in an homage to Galileo, first notebook in the discovery of, uh, of the Jupyter Galilean moon. And that's basically the notebook that you have since 2014 is what, what is Jupyter today, uh, with mostly improvements on the um, on a, on a day to day, day to day uh, uh, basis. And today uh, we have more than 1,000 contributors, um, dozens of, uh, of, of projects, 
Um, and, and we received the ACM Software System Award last year, which means that we're starting to believe that we have some, some impact on how, uh, how science is, um, is done. And just a couple of numbers. We can see that um, since 2014, the search term for Jupyter on Google and the number of notebooks available on GitHub is, is growing exponentially. So we believe that um, Jupyter is seeing an increasing uh, adoption. We have more than 150 repositories, thousands and more contributors. Um, and if you tally up all the projects we have, we are in average of more than one release of one project per day. Um, so there is really a lot, of, a lot happening. It's really hard to have metrics, but we believe with some estimation that we have more than 8 million users. Um, for comparisons worldwide, there is uh, approximately 21 million self-reported developers and 4.4 in North America. Um, so that's that's quite uh, quite impressive if you if you if you see this this number. And so if you've heard a bit about Twitter, you may have heard a lot about it, uh, and it may look like there is a lot of things uh, happening. Uh, I'm going to reassure you: when you're a core developer, you just realize that there is a lot more that um, you can't see happening uh, every day, uh, and even people for whom it's a full-time job cannot uh, cannot follow along. So I'm just going to to show to show a couple of things that are going on with Twitter. Uh, first, we try to really uh, focus on the community. Um, everybody that is a core contributor or is uh, highly active um, try to meet uh, between once and twice a year. Um, depends where. Most of the time we are in Berkeley. Uh, and in these pictures, about half the folks are from industry and about half the folks are uh, from uh, academia. Uh, and a lot of the people you see here are actually volunteers. Actually, they are authorized to work on Jupiter, but they're not working on Jupiter as part of their official, uh, official duty. And we have a completely uh, open governance. Um, so um, if you want to join, and you're, you're welcome to, to look at that and, um, and participate. We couldn't, of course, do that without all our sponsors, the people who trust us. Um, there is, of course, people who give us, um, give us money to work on, on various projects. And also all of these institutions like Berkeley and Laurent Berkeley National Lab that let us work part of your, um, uh, part of your time on, um, on, on Jupiter. And so let's try to, 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 to go back again, take a bit in time and see why we had the need to create Jupiter. To do that, we need to come back to the life cycle of a scientific idea and, and how, how you actually do, um, do science. Um, most of the time, it starts with uh, individual computational exploratory work. You want to, to figure out something, you have an idea, and you say, well, I need, I need to, 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 to find if, if this is something which is worth looking into. Uh, at some point, you reach a limit because not everybody can know everything, and you need to, um, to collaborate, collaborate and scale on the human side. So you will, um, you will try to reach to computational experts that can make your, your thing more performant and also some domain-specific experts that can give you insight of how things are working. At some point, you need to scale on the machine side um, and have um, parallel production. So for example, run on HPC or, uh, or cloud. And once you hopefully have a result, a number of graphs that confirm our, our, uh, our future hypothesis, you want to publish in the wide, uh, wide sense, so not only peer-reviewed uh, publication, but if you do a blog post or if you just post something on archive uh, or just go to a conference and give a talk, then this is communication to make your idea um, understood by other and known by other. And after, hopefully, you want to educate the general public and undergrads and all of that. Uh, and then go back to uh, go back to one. But when you do computing for a scientific idea, uh, the purpose of computing is uh, is insight, not the numbers themselves. Um, and so let's look back at, at the life cycle of a scientific idea uh, and look at what's happening when you're actually doing this work. So when you're doing individual work, you're, you you are going to use, for example, um, a REPL or script. Uh, and then at some point you need to move to collaborative development and then suddenly you need to move everything you have to Dropbox or Google Doc, maybe building things back and forth. Uh, but if you're using software a lot, maybe you're going to use Git. And now you're into, you need to scale up with your machine. <coughs> Apologies. And now you need to rewrite everything using MPI, C, batch jobs, and learn how to use, um, use a cluster. 
And once you need to publish, well, you need to move everything to Word, LaTeX, PowerPoint, do mistakes when you copy and paste um, um, screenshots because you copy it just once, you for, you, there is a bug, you rerun it, and now you need to synchronize everything. And an all new set of tools for education. And what you realize is that each of these tools has a significant overhead. Um, there is, of course, a cognitive overhead of you having to, uh, to switch context, but there is time to install, time to deploy, time to master a tool. And one of the questions is, can we create a set of tools with a minimal overhead and enough flexibility? We can um, do a parallel with popular data science languages, um, like on HPC, Fortran, C, and C++ are fast and really common, but take a significant time to develop and time to get, need to get the right skills to be able to use that. Uh, while with you use something like Python, R and Julia um, that are usually slower, um, but they can be useful immediately. Like as soon as you've entered a couple of commands, you already have insight into your data and you can iterate on, um, on it. And the question is, can you do the same for, um, for all the people? And so that's where the rise of Jupyter came, um, came through. Um, there is an increasing number of disciplines that have a fast growing amount of data. It's now relatively easy to have access to a large computing environment. And so now, instead of adapting to technology, technology should be a tool that adapts to you. It should empower the user. Um, you shouldn't have to, 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 to fall to what the technology wants you to do, but the technology should adapt to you. It should amplify your domain knowledge and expertise. So I allow you to focus on what you're good on. Um, if you're um, if you're a geoscience scientist, we don't want you to have to learn how to, to do nice computation, learn about um, how to allocate things on the heap or on the stack. We want you to just like get your work done. And most of the time, because you can't work on your own, you should facilitate sharing and collaboration. And Jupyter tried to provide a framework that can uh, be used in all these steps of, this, of the life cycle of a scientific idea. There are some, some key things here. Um, we have decided to make it BISD license, so it's free to use and redistribute even commercially. Um, and it's completely open source and community maintained. It's really important for sustainability. Um, the commercial uh, part is really important to, to, get, to get money into the system to work well and being used by businesses that rely on that. And the open source and community maintenance is really important for diversity and equal access to, to that. You don't need to be a million dollar lab to have access to Jupyter. Um, or you just, you just need to uh, download it and um, uninstall it. And so when people speak about Jupyter, what do they mean? It can uh, vary a lot, especially if you talk to the core team and the people who are familiar with Jupyter. Uh, but mostly, if you, if you speak with a scientist which is not really involved and is using it, uh, what they mean when they say Jupyter, um, they speak about one piece only, which is um, the notebook. And so the notebook is um, a web server and a web app um, that allow you to write code, narrative, math, and, uh, and display, display results. So that's the front end part. And um, this, this front end is attached to something in the back end that does computation for you. Um, no specific languages, uh, and we call that a kernel. Um, and, and the coupling of the two is usually the notebook and what we call Jupyter. And in these notebooks, the result can be static, like for example, images or text. Um, interactive, if you have a, a map that you can, you can drag and zoom, that doesn't require computation from the kernel side, um, <clears throat> or dynamic, where basically here you can see on, on the screenshot on the right, you have um, a Lorentz uh, attractor system um, with, with sliders. And if you move one of these sliders, it will change the parameter of the um, differential equations that govern the system, and the kernel will recompute that. So let's look a bit into uh, what, what is a notebook. So in a notebook here, it's the Lorentz uh, notebook zoomed in a bit. Um, you have some part of narrative um, with, with math code results and what you can see in green on the side is dynamic control and so everything which is orange here as a narrative code and results are embedded into a document and so when you share this document with someone else um, they can see the narrative the math the code and the result without having to rerun the computation the dynamic control here do actually need to rerun the code because you're changing the parameter and you need to resolve the equation but one of the key pieces here is that because the notebook formats the book documents stores all this information, uh, when you share your analysis, you have to share the narrative, the code, and the results together. So when you send the results to someone, 
they can see your code. And when you send the code to someone, they can see the result without having to, um, to rerun everything. One of the key things that make uh, the notebook um, really powerful and increase adoption is the use of, um, of web technologies. So web technologies are really accessible. Um, it's really familiar to users. We don't always realize that, especially when you're uh, computationally savvy. Um, but when you tell a new undergrad or graduate student that they need to learn SSH and how to submit things on the batch queue, they get scared. Uh, and usually the terminal is something scary. Well, if you say to someone, you just have to use a web browser, uh, suddenly they just, they just get more, more comfortable. And also because you just need a browser, it's ubiquitous and available everywhere. Uh, even on an iPad, you can run Jupyter. Um, so you can literally control an HPC cluster with terabyte of RAM from, um, from your iPad. There is a lot of money going into web development. Um, we all know why, which means that there is a lot of increase in performance and functionality in web browser. Um, so, for example, the speed of JavaScript, JavaScript is, is relatively fast for only like since only 2012, which is about six years. And now we're starting to have things like 3D in the browser, VR in the browser, WebAssembly in the browser. And so all of these functionalities that are developed by the, um, uh, by the industry came for free now for scientific reasons. The fact that we use a browser also allows us to have identical use for local and remote um, Jupyter. And so whether you install it on your machine or whether it's installed by, um, by, by your sysadmin on your cluster, uh, the interface is strictly identical. And you can also use it from education when you're teaching a class, what you're doing, doing your own research. You don't have this cognitive overhead of switching or having to completely relearn a tool uh, when you move from one place to, to, to another. And because it's a relatively familiar interface, we can have a different kind of domain expertise people to, uh, to collaborate. So if you have someone which is really good at optimization, they can write optimized code in a notebook. If you have someone who is really good at visualization, which is also important for communication, they can also collaborate on the same, uh, same notebook. And everything is uh, open document format, as simple as possible. Um, so we decided to use JSON um, that embed all the results. Uh, JSON is visible in all languages, so you don't have to buy into Python, buy into MATLAB, or buy into anything. And in approximately an afternoon, you can write something that understands uh, understand human notices that books. Because everything is embedded, there is no uh, less risk of, of copy and past errors, of missing synchronization between the code and the result. So when you see a figure, you don't have to, to ask, well, what was the version of the code that prints this figure? Uh, it's there. And it's make, make it relatively easy to share and modify. If you share a notebook, usually you can be relatively confident that someone else will be able to rerun it or and change the code and see how it affects the result. We'll see that after this, um, this, uh, this binder. Um, we recently released JupyterLab, uh, which is not yet on version 1.0, but stable for users. Uh, one of the many requests we have is that notebooks are great, but you want to be able to extend your working interface uh, with other, uh, other kind of, um, of application of interaction. And JupyterLab is going closer to an IDE. What you can see here on, on, on both, both sides and both screenshots is as uh, a notebook is still central into the interface. So in the center of each screenshot, you can see a notebook where people are, are, are doing code. But now you can have a um, panel layout and you can arrange different type of, of viewers for different type of file. On the left, you can see that you have a terminal on the uh, on one side of, of the screenshot. And on the right, you can see that you have not only a notebook, but a view of a map of the GeoJSON file uh, with the same file thing just underneath. And you can also see a CSV. So if you have specific files that are not notebooks that you um, want to open uh, in, in Jupyter, now you can do that with, uh, with, with Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Lab. And so we can install uh, Jupyter Lab completely side by side with classic notebook. Um, so there is no, no need to rewrite your code, no need to change anything to your infrastructure. Uh, everything works exactly, um, exactly the same, except you can have uh, multiple, um, multiple view uh, side by side. And now you can basically start to uh, support extension. If you have extension, you can, um, you can use it on JupyterLab. And it will be the only thing that will get new features. The classic notebook will be sent down at some point. So if you're using only the classic notebook and know about Jupyter, start to look at JupyterLab. It will be the, uh, the right time. The right
Jupyter also supports many languages. Uh, we really think that you sh the technology should um, adapt to you and you should not adapt to the technology. So if you want to use Jupyter with uh, Haskell or with R or with Perl or Scala or Ruby, uh, it should be possible. Most of these are um, developed by the community um, and there is now over a hundred languages. And this is really nice because you don't need to change the code that already exists. You can just bring your code and, and use it with, uh, with Jupyter. There are also integration with, <coughs> excuse me, many other tools. So you don't need to use Jupyter with a normal notebook interface. If you want to use it from within your text editor, uh, you can without, without an issue. Everything is based on open protocols that are relatively simple. And so for example, a lot of people are happy to use um, Visual Studio Code and execute code in Jupyter uh, using a Visual Studio Code, um, Studio code plugin. And we also think that's one of the reasons why um, Jupyter is um, is so popular that you can you can bring your uh, own um, tool to that. And so Notebook are are really good at um, supporting material and interactive companion in many cases. Um, more than twenty years ago, Bucket and Donahoe said that when you publish an article about computational science in a scientific publication. Um, it is not the scholarship itself, but merely an, uh, merely an advertising for the scholarship. The actual scholarship is a complete software development environment and the complete set of instructions which generates the figures. And it's hard to imagine that that was uh, more than 20 years ago, um, seeing current, uh, current, um, current climate. Um, and so we can see that more and more um, into, um, into today's publications. Um, what you can see is many articles now uh, have their normal publication, but have as a supplementary material either a, a Git repository um, or, um, or something else um, that um, allow you to uh, rerun everything and see, see the results, modify the results, um, and see how a change model or change in the data are, is actually um, is actually affecting uh, affecting the um, result. We see more and more so executable books. Um, so all of these books are basically have been written partially or totally as notebook, which means that now when you're learning a specific domain, instead of um, having a one-way flow of information from the author to you, you can actually run the book, modify the books. Uh, change the data sets or change the algorithm and see how um, that affects the result. And that is critical to get a better uh, understanding and um, a better feeling of how, uh, how things are working. And Jupyter allow also easy and scalable um, deployment um, using something we call Jupyter Hub. Um, Jupyter Hub is mostly a technology as a um, notebook application is at the base or always single users. And if you want to scale, you need to use something on top of, uh, um, of, of, of a notebook application to allow many users to use different, different versions. Uh, if you're interested in uh, installing Jupyter Hub at scale, I encourage you to use, um, to look at Jupyter Hub. And in particular, I'll look at um, zero to Jupyter Hub. The link is, is below here. Uh, which tell you about in a couple of hours how you can run a multi-machine cluster in Kubernetes for many users in Jupyter Hub. And so Jupyter Hub is just a technology and you can you can build a lot of things on top on top of it that allow you to go really quickly from not participating to a, the, um, to a scientific um, exploration to, to being directly, directly in it. It's used by many for-profit companies, uh, but we're not going to focus on that, uh, that for today. The first one I want to talk about is Binder. Um, so Binder is the technology that gives you the, um, the least flexibility in, um, in controlling how you, you use you use a repository and, um, and notebooks, uh, but it's really, really fast to deploy. You usually have nothing, um, nothing to do. And so Binder is a technology that takes any GitHub repository with Jupyter notebooks, um, we'll turn it for you into a Docker image, so that ensures reproducibility and quick deployment. And it starts an isolated ephemeral server in a few seconds for, for you to interact with. So if, for example, you see, you see an article that is using Jupyter Notebook 
on GitHub and you say, well, I'm pretty sure if I change this parameter, uh, it's going to affect the result in this way and you want to explore that quickly, you don't want to download everything on your computer and install all the software. And so Binder will give you something which is ephemeral for a couple of hours, uh, but which is zero install. As a side note, it's not limited to GitHub, Notebook, Jupyter, Bucker, or ephemeral. Um, so you can really modify that a lot, uh, but that's usually how most of the people are, are, are using Binder. One of the main deployments of Binder is uh, mybinder.org. Um, so it's one of the public instances. There are others. It's completely open. You can even see the stats of how many people are running code. Uh, and because, of course, it's anonymous and it's ephemeral, we have limited CPU and memory and network. Uh, and it's, it's uh, so ephemeral two hours. <coughs> restricted so that you can't run that many repo in parallel um, because people are mining Bitcoin units or trying to. Um, and when you give it a link to repository, it will build the repository on demand and cache images for fast launch after the fact. You don't need authorization from the repository owner to run it on Binder. Uh, if you find a repository that is not Binder enabled, you can copy and paste the link still and it will run. So the way it works is you see, for example, um, this, uh, this nice repository, um, which is related to, to this workshop, have, have a link on the top. I can grab, grab the URL, go to mymar.org, paste it into uh, to the field, click submit, and hopefully after a few seconds, uh, I'm going to be, um, sorry, to be shown um, a, a repository I can interact with. Here it's, it's not a correct screenshot, but it's just for, um, for demonstration purpose. And now you can immediately uh, interact with the repository and see how changing affects affect them. Binder can also give you a launch binder button that you can copy and paste back into your readme um, in, on GitHub so that you don't have your users to do this dance on their own. You can just say, my repository is ready from Binder. Just click here and you can interact with it. Um, so you have several ways of using that. So for example, if you saw 2017 Nobel Prize in physics about discovery of gravitational waves, they actually released their data and their notebooks that were used to do the analysis online uh, with a subset of, um, of the actual data because actual data is relatively big. Um, and you can just click a button and um, run that and discover gravitational waves on your own. You can also use more constraint views, for example, in a textbook on, on the right side, where um, instead of giving complete freedom to, to users or to your students, you can actually limit their interaction to only a couple of parameters and have them explore your, um, your, um, your textbook. And what you can see here is uh, one of the um, notebooks that could be used in one of the um, later, uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Later, you know. And so, um, I have some questions from the audience on the chat that we uh, talked about. A second deployment um, is um, using Jupyter in the classroom. And so, here you can see Data Science at Berkeley, which is, I think, a 600 um, student class. And um, now, the, by the have they're using has slightly um, slightly more controllable by, by the people deploying it. It's not completely ephemeral. Now, every student, as soon as they have a Berkeley credential um, and, um, mm -hmm. uh, and are enrolled in the class, can actually access the Jupyter Hub online and have access to the class material. Uh, but now they are able to have persistency, which means that they can um, get uh, get the homework assignment or submit the homework assignment or change the package that are installed. Uh, still, it's completely managed like everybody at the class level have the same, um, the same environment. So you're sure that you don't have discrepancy in between, um, in between, uh, in between students. For students, it is relatively zero setup uh, with campus-wide deployment. Um, and you can basically, when you start your data science class, uh, you can directly focus on domain knowledge. You don't have to do the first, first session to have everybody install things on their machines. You can just log in and you can go directly into the weeds of, of data science or into geoscience uh, on, um, uh, on, on day one. Um, and um, students can still, if they want to actually install Jupyter on, on their own machine. 
And so one of the questions uh, of the audience was, um, what has been the most surprising for you or the core developers on Jupyter uh, has scale? And so one of the most surprising things is how people are, uh, are using it and on which scale, like without asking us, we had people telling us maybe five or six years ago, uh, hey, I have issues on these machines that have um, 200,000 nodes, um, and can you help us debug that? And we're like, well, no, because we need 200,000 nodes to, to debug it, so we will have to, uh, uh, to, to, to bear, uh, bear with us. Another comment is that the yes, other class mentioned is now at 1,000 more um, students and fastest growing class in campus history. Uh, so that's, that's in the chat. Um, and so yes, so data science class is, is, is growing really fast. We, we know of uh, even more uh, bigger, bigger deployment. Um, and I've heard a lot of, uh, of people saying that now it's actually the undergrad who are teaching faculty because they are better at data science. I don't know if, uh, if, if this, is, uh, this is true. Uh, true or not. Um, so one other advantage of deploying uh, the classroom is auto grading. Um, um, Jessica Hamrick, um, whose picture is down there, did a fantastic job um, creating a complete way of auto grading notebook for students. Um, so you can write your your notebook with solution, submit them to students. Uh, it will automatically strip down the solution and it will auto grade them when they get back, which I give a lot of freedom for TAs and time to have more one on one. Um, session um, session with, um, with students. And one of the um, latest thing I want to talk about is a really large deployment in the, in the cloud or system called Pangeo. Um, and so Pangeo is, um, as I say, on their website, uh, on pangeo.org, um, is, a, is a, a project to foster collaboration around the open source scientific Python ecosystem for, uh, for climate science. Um, support the development with domain-specific geoscience packages and improve the scalability of these tools to handle petabyte scale to set on HPC and, uh, and uh, flat of, uh, cloud platform. Um, the nice thing about Pangeo is that they're taking something like Jupyter, which is really a generic tool, and now they're starting to specialize it, uh, especially for climate science, and they're making deployments, uh, deployment on HPC or on the cloud relatively, um, relatively easy and straightforward. And so they're using a lot of a really recent technology um, to, make, to make the use of, of, of Jupyter and the deployment of Jupyter uh, relatively single -click. Uh, and I'm, if I have time, I'm going to try to do a, to do a demo at the end um, and, and show you how with a single click you can basically get Pangeo, uh, Pangeo on, on, on the cloud. Um, and so this basically make HPC way more accessible for, uh, for domain scientists. You don't have to use SSH um, and, and, and Q submission anymore. You can just uh, access a URL, log in with your uh, already existing credential um, and um, uh, and and have and work typically. Um, uh, the two two images you can see here is actually uh, one deployment of Pangeo on the cloud um, with a DAX cluster on the right, uh, which um, distributes tasks to um, to the cloud, um, and and the result of the C elevation on on the left. Uh, and so it's completely managed um, uh, on Kubernetes. So everybody have their um, their own Jupyter with their own environment that they can completely uh, completely control uh, with persistency. Um, you log in with GitHub, um, and you can whitelist or um, or uh, ban people. Uh, it's customized for uh, for geoscience, uh, and so it's persist it's persisting server on Google Cloud, so you can have a relatively large amount of RAM, CPU, and nodes, and it's completely dynamically scalable. Um, so you can basically scale your cloud up just when you're using it and scale it down immediately once you're done. So you don't need to have 100% uh, time of using CPU. You are not constrained by, by, by your system. Um, spend, spend your computing money just, um, just when you... And I will try to do a small demo at the end to see you how easy it is to... Um, to access um, to, to access an HPC system in the cloud. 
Uh, I also see that in the chat we have another core developer of Jupyter, Carol, who is here. And so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to send to send questions her way. She is uh, she's uh, helping. And she's saying hi in the chat. Um, if you're not in, if you're looking at the recording, feel free to join on one of the Gitter channel we have um, to ask questions. After the fact, we still have developer around that will be happy to to answer uh, answer your question. I'm going to talk about tiny bit about the future, and then I will try to do a demo if we have time. And so the future right now is Jupyter Lab. Uh, I already talked about Jupyter Lab. Um, it extends the notebook interface with text editor, shell, um, and etc. is really important because um, everything is plugins, and plugins are first class citizen. So if you have something specific for your domain that you want to have in Jupyter Lab, you can write something for it and you can install it. Um, and so, for example, in, in the screenshot here um, that you've seen already before, uh, on the um, on the uh, front front screenshot in the upper right, you can see that there is a, a map, uh, and this map is a plugin which is not in basic Jupyter Lab, and that you can install with a single line and allow you to to display GeoJSON file um, directly into um, into Jupyter Lab. There is a lot of work that is happening on real time collaboration. Um, the plugin for real-time collaboration is actually working, except um, well, it's based by um, Google uh, Google Docs uh, protocol. Except Google deprecated their API, so now we just have to to find a, a new provider for that. But we had a prototype of being having having multiple users working on um, the same time in a notebook and being able to discuss about results in different rooms and run code simultaneously, um, which we're really happy about and hope to uh, completely release. Um, really soon. So here is an example, if I can have the uh, GIF working of, of the JSON file. And so by using a plugin, now you can not only have your result display text and images, but display maps. Uh, and as you can see in, in this shift, uh, the um, maps do not need to be um, on Earth uh, always. They can actually be, I don't remember if this is Mars or uh, Mars or, uh, or the Moon. Uh, but you can you can display anything which is styled um, with coordinates can be um, can be um, displayed. Uh, if you want to know more, because we're short on time, I um, invite you to come to JupyterCon in New York at the end of August. Um, if you're already based in New York, the last day, the 25th, is a Saturday um, and it's completely free. You can just come, just register for um, it's, it's a free registration. Um, but you can you can. Uh, can come and participate to our community day and sprint day if you want to either discuss or uh, or, or, or code on Jupyter. And so now I'm going to do a short demo um, and take and take questions. So feel free to send questions my way, and I will exit exit keynote and try to show you how uh, how Pangeo work and how in a couple of of minutes you can access an HPC cluster. So for those of you who want to ask questions, please pop it in the chat window so uh, we can take questions while, um, while he's preparing his demo. Thanks. Okay. Um, so here is Pangeo. Um, so it's a, it's a website. And uh, you can see that I, I'm at pangeo.org. Um, and I'm just going to sign into with GitHub. Um, if I do it the first time, it will ask GitHub to allow my credential, but I've already done that once. Uh, and I haven't changed anything to the configuration. So what, uh, you, what you will see, what you see the first time you come, you come to, to open GeoCrest. I'm just going to start my server. It's going to take a couple of seconds. And what it's doing right now for uh, for us is uh, starting a Kubernetes cluster on on Google Cloud, uh, which is backed by I don't remember a node that has something like four CPUs and um, fifteen gigabytes of um, of RAM. So that will be my main machine. Uh, but we, I will have also access to a number of workers. So I'm on Google Cloud. So technically, I can do almost. I'm going to, to stay low because this is provided for me for free, so I'm not going to, to use too much of the computation resources. And that's it. So my, my cluster is, uh, has been started, so it's already a number of, of, of notebooks here. Uh, we can start a terminal here and um, check the number of CPU. So proc uh, CPU info and just grab for uh, proc. You see that we have four processors and cat. Um, Proc dot uh, meminfo 
And if you see at the top, I'm going to scroll, so it's really slow. I have about 15 gigabytes of, uh, of RAM. And so let's let's start this notebook. Um, I actually, I didn't roll, roll this notebook. Someone else did it for me, and I'm just going to see if I can run through it and understand how things work relatively easily. Um, so here it's slowly starting up. You saw on the upper right corner, a corner here that I now have um, a Python, a Python, um, a Python notebook, and I can uh, go through the notebook and and, and uh, run things. Um, so these are a simulation of the precipitation and temperature data in the United States. Um, there was a hundred runs of simulations, and only nine of them are. Uh, uh, on the data set I will load here. Uh, and now I'm going to um, to attach to a, a cluster um, with our 10 workers. Um, you can see here the, the cluster is slowly starting. Um, I'm going to, should ask, okay, I'm going to request 10 workers and scale. Um, and it's going to um, to show you slowly, um, slowly appear. Let me see if I can open the dashboard to show you the cluster coming up. I'm sorry, with, uh, with Zoom broadcasting everything, my computer is extremely slow. So I'm going to size this on the side. So that's basically each of my workers, uh, how much memory they're using and which tasks are processing. And on this side, it's my, uh, my notebook. So I can just ask for my worker. And let's try to load the data set and see if, uh, if the data is uh, coming through. And now I have uh, I have my data set um, with latitude, longitude, time, um, and 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 different uh, my cluster is not scaling up for whatever reason. Matthias, for those of the folks on the line who are completely unfamiliar with Jupiter, could you while you're running this, can you sort of point out how you're executing some of the cells? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is this is a, um, a narrative cell. Um, on my keyboard, if I press Shift Enter, I execute the cell. Uh, so for example, let me create a new cell here. If I do one plus one, it is a really easy computation. What I can I just ask with my keyboard, or on pressing this button here, but I'm I'm, I'm familiar with the keyboard. I can just uh, press a play, and it will execute this code. And this does not need to be text. It can be images, as you saw. Or here, it can be something more dynamic that allows me to, um, to, to interact directly with, um, with my, uh, my dashboard. So this, what you can see here, that a uh, cube cluster is sort of a visual representation of this object cluster here. Um, that I've also now see on the side here. And you see now my cluster has started. I now have um, about eight workers. Uh, and here you see that they are, they are loading data. And so one of the questions was, what are the best way to provide data, make data available for work within Jupyter? Um, we, we just expose underlying Python libraries. So everything that you can open with Python is basically good with Jupyter. Uh, we don't make any choice, um, choice for you at, uh, uh, at site point. Um, and so let's see if we can do some processing with our cluster. And so what you should be able to see on the side here um, is we are going to have a task graph and you can see that each of our workers is currently trying to, uh, to handle a task. When you see a red, a red line, basically workers are communicating with each other and sending things back and forth. Uh, and you can see on the top here how much data is, is stored per, um, uh, per, uh, per worker. Uh, you can see now that my computation is uh, is done. So I can actually plot the average temperature across a year for the United States. And you can see that as we expected, the temperature is higher in the South, um, which is uh, which was, um, not, not too much surprising. And you can see that on, um, on the mountain here, it's, um, 
its uh, its uh, its color. And so you can do other computation relatively fast, and you can see that the cluster will react automatically here. And you can see that it's pretty easy to get to get an eight machine cluster. Um, and if I want to, to to scale to sixteen machine, which I'm going to do in a, right now, I'm just going to do sixteen and click scale, and now my uh, my Jupyter installation is is scaling to 16 automatically behind my back. Um, and now when I do the next, the next computation, uh, you should see the number, uh, the number of workers appearing here should, um, should slowly, uh, slowly increase. Um, so one question is how would I create a community cluster like Pangeo? In the case of Pangeo, is LBL Google funding the cluster? Uh, you will have to ask the Pangeo people. Uh, I'm not too much involved in that. Uh, they have some credits, yes, from Google or from Amazon. Um, go to Pangeo dash data on, on GitHub. Um, there is a work on the Pangeo workshop in mid August. You can also um, attend this workshop and see what they're, uh, what they're doing. Uh, and they're actually working currently. They have an NSS, NSF funding also um, to work into uh, so Pangeo works right now, and they're trying to get it to work from medium data to large data sets. Um, so it can handle a couple of terabytes data sets, but it's not let get great for petabyte scale. Uh, and one of the NSS self-funding goal is to actually have a lot of the Pangeo technology, which is behind like basically X-Array, Dask, and everything, um, to scale to terabytes, uh, terabyte data sets. Um, I'm going to um, to stop there and check for questions and give a little more time to um, to others to uh, to present present that work and thank you very much everyone. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I think we still have time for a couple questions. Uh, if anybody has, some, and then we'll take a five minute stretch break after that while we're transitioning to the next part. I'm slowly scrolling through the question and we'll try to answer. And for the one question about using state data sets, that's going to be part of the next uh, presentation. Just as an overview, we'll have uh, an example of using uh, both USGS data through an API, um, which is an application programming interface for programmatically retrieving data, as well as um, an example of using uh, a a comma separated values CSV file from the state water board's website. So we have two different ways of retrieving data that's highlighted in the following examples. Yeah, so one of the question is what is uh, what are the integration points between Jupyter and Java? Um, there are many pieces in Jupyter. Uh, what I'm going to assume you mean is, is kernels. Um, so kernels are the thing that execute code in the back. Um, what you can do is Google a list of Jupyter kernel on Google. Um, it's my machine is really really slow, uh, and so it's a wiki page. Basically, you don't have to ask us to implement. What my recording has failed. Good. Uh, you don't have to ask us for anything to create a kernel for Jupyter. Um, you can just create one on your own. Some people wrote a kernel in an afternoon, which may not be high quality kernel, and other kernels are, are years old. Uh, and if you look for here. For Java, not JavaScript. Um, so you have Jupyter kernel JSR, for example, that run Java. Um, you probably have uh, have others. Um, you probably have. Anyway, I let you look at this page, and uh, then you go to the corresponding um, corresponding projects, and in the the project will tell you how to install the Java. Uh, kernel for uh, for Jupyter. I think there's one last question, Matthias. Um, if there are existing data sets on Pangeo um, that are already loaded to go, or is it just a platform? So what I showed here is just one of the deployment of Pangeo. Um, then people will deploy Pangeo on their own machine or on their own cluster, and then it's up to you to get the data sets here. Um, it's deployed on Cheyenne, I think. 
Um, and so there, you well, you have access to your file system and to your API. And one other thing you can do is, for example, um, when you deploy the cluster, um, is um, inject directly token authentication of users into their kernels. So when they execute remote API calls to get something, they're pre-authenticated. So no, no on the example I showed, there is no, no, there is just a small tiny bit data set, but, uh, but if you deploy your own Pangeo, you can, um, you can, you can put the data you want. Great, thanks Matthias and to Carol in the background for answering questions. Um, for those of you who wanna learn more, I encourage you to go to the jupiter.org website. They have tons of documentation as well as examples out there for you to learn more. I know this is sort of a, a deep dive already pretty quickly. So, so we're just, like I said, uh, touching the tip of the iceberg here and there's, there's just a lot more to learn because it's a really rich environment. And if you have any, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to send a personal email to um, to me. I will be happy to um, to respond. And uh, his slides are all on the. Uh, you can link to, get the link to it from the website, so you could also sort of review this material online. So we'll take a five minute quick five minute break while we transition speakers. Next, we'll have Michelle Newcomer from Berkeley Labs, presenting on using. Uh, an R notebook to do water data analysis uh, for the Sonoma water uh, in the Sonoma County after all the wildfires happened last year. And then following that, we'll have a presentation from Valerie Patella, who is a intern here. She's from Sacramento State uh, and she's an intern here at Berkeley Lab and she's gonna be presenting on using data from GeoTracker Gamma from the State Water Board's website uh, to do some analysis of produce water disposal in California. So we have that at, in about five minutes. Thanks.